I'm actually an accidental public speaker, mm -hmm. meaning I never sought to be specifically a public speaker. I started out building a business. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have heard of it. It's called Sleep Country USA. And in the early days of my business, having started with only $5,000, I did not have the money to hire professional on-air talent. So I did my own radio and television commercials. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and later I realized when you're letting a, an individual walk around with the reputation of, their, of your business in their hands, it's probably better if you do that yourself anyway. Mm -hmm. So I did my own radio and television ads, which a, kind of created a bit of a local celebrity persona as a, as a result of this. People would stop me in the grocery store and places I would go, and, and that was all fine. But then also Chamber of Commerces and Rotary Clubs and, and all sorts of business groups mm -hmm. would contact me and say, hey, would you come speak at our group? Mm -hmm. I guess the presumption was if you can do 30 seconds, you can do 30 <laughs> minutes. And I don't know where anybody comes to that conclusion, but that was the presumption. And I, I got the first invitation. I thought, oh my goodness, if I go in there and talk about, you know, selling mattresses, everyone will be asleep in the first five minutes. Well, that's what you want, selling mattresses. Well, right? that's what I was doing, I mean, <laughs> essentially. So I said, well, what do I have that every business person has in common? And we had just been voted a best place to work. And that is done by a blind survey of your staff. And so I said, you know, I bet other business people would be surprised at what simple things actually got mentioned on people's surveys. So I started out talking about employee motivation because it's something, no matter what your business, we have that in common. Chances are you have some employees, even if they're not on your payroll, who you have to motivate. Right. They can be contract workers, they can be people at your vendors who you need cooperation from. So this was a common topic that I could talk about. Mm. And I honestly, you know, I accepted a lot of those invitations simply because it was a kind of a backdoor way to market your business, mm -hmm. even though I didn't talk about our products or mm -hmm. when you start talking about your philosophy of how you do business and people want to do business with, with businesses they identify with and, and respect. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we actually could track mm -hmm. specific increases in business based on where I had appeared to speak. Mm -hmm. So if I spoke up in Everett, the Everett store and the Linwood store would see an increase, a, a measurable increase over the next 90 days. Mm -hmm. So we said, oh, this is a genius marketing plan we didn't even know about. So I started accepting as many of those invitations as I possibly could because again, you're spending a lot of money advertising mm -hmm. when you really have a chance to one-on-one -on -one connect with people. It's a whole different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And then I assumed once I sold my business and retired that people would quit calling and would quit asking. And what I learned was I actually got to be a very good public speaker in the process and they never quit calling. And to this day, people still go to my website on a regular basis and fill out the little online form which comes to me in an email. I check my calendar and I'm all over speaking to all sorts of business groups even to this day. Basically, I was just trying not to bore my audience because an audience will forgive you anything except being boring. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a common enough topic that everyone in the room can relate to it and then just give them your own perspective on it, mm -hmm. something they didn't know about it perhaps, right. that would be useful. Well, I, I really just wanted, you know, I wanted to reach as many people as possible uh, because people do business with people they like, so the more people could kind of get past uh, whatever irritated them, the number of ads that ran or the, mm -hmm. the jingle that was stuck in their head or whatever it was, mm -hmm. and actually understand what it was that I believed in terms of a business philosophy, mm -hmm. that's what other business people related to. We had a lot of common things, whether whether they had warehouse and delivery workers, I had those. Whether they had professional salespeople, I had those. Whether they had office personnel, I had those. So I could share my experience in motivating employees in a successful company mm -hmm. in a way that other business people could embrace and go, I can use that idea in my business when I get back this afternoon. And I think that was part of what made 
me such a popular speaker. Plus, I have a sense of humor about myself and this whole persona thing. And so, you know, I, I was an entertaining speaker at the yeah. same time I was informative. I th well, I mean, my introduction, because because I owned a chain of mattress stores, for goodness sake. I mean, what's glamorous about that? Nothing. Um, but one of the local radio disc jockeys kind of dubbed me tongue-in-cheek the mattress queen. And I said, well, you know what? That's kind of good. I can own that. Yeah. So actually, my introduction, when I speak, starts, she's often called the mattress queen. And since most of the people already kind of know who I am, that always gets a chuckle. Yeah. And then it goes on to say, you know, she's known for the chain of mattress stores that she founded, you know, and they go on to explain that and my awards and things of that nature. So as the mattress queen, I mean, you gotta, yeah. you gotta have some fun with it. I mean, so I generally open by kind of walking up and going, can you imagine actually going through your life as the mattress queen? I mean, that really wasn't something nice girls wanted to be called when I was growing <laughs> up. And everybody gets a chuckle. And now, once yeah. people, if you can get people to laugh in the yeah. first 30 seconds of your presentation, yeah. where do you want to go? I'm all yours. This yeah. is not going to be boring. This yeah. is going to be fun. Yeah. Let's have some fun. Yeah. People are much more receptive. But, but I don't tell jokes. Yeah. I don't say, the duck walked into the bar. I don't even know yeah. any of these kind of jokes, you know. Yeah. Um, but I have a sense of humor about myself yeah. and about the, and, and there's always a way to tell a story that is a little more light. Mm. You can be very dull and dory like this, or you can kind of be a little more animated. And I think when you are more natural and animated, it comes across people will chuckle periodically, you know, they'll go, oh, if you say something where, you know, somebody, you know, it, it's, it's, that's what you're looking for, that connection to the audience. Mm. So, so I don't tell, I don't use humor. I would never say I'm a humorist, but I'm an entertaining speaker. Okay, when I was in high school, I took speech theater, drama, debate, oh. all of that stuff with no intention of mm -hmm. ever pursuing these things as a career. Mm -hmm. um, I had come out of a private parochial school, so I was far advanced mm -hmm. in the English department of anything that they had in the high school. And so I had to take English credits anyway to graduate. Mm -hmm. And having basically quizzed out of everything that resembled a real English course, mm -hmm. that left me with things like poetry interpretation and, mm -hmm. and speech and theater and debate, all of which mm -hmm. I enjoyed. And I frankly did it because I liked it. Mm -hmm. And my dad used to always say, that stuff's just fine, but be sure you do something that's gonna earn you a living. Little did I know that I already was doing something that was going to earn me a living. Not pursuing it as a career. I think that's a very, very arduous path that very, very few people are successful at. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that having some skills in a public speaking arena for the purpose of the confidence factor is a big deal. And I think there's a lot of ways you can get it, but one of the easiest ways, I think, is to take some sort of a, a speech class, if you will. Um, it doesn't matter if you ever intend to pursue that as a career. I think having that skill in your back pocket is useful. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you go out to interview for a job, you, that, that skill comes in play. And then even once you're working somewhere, you know, you're gonna have an idea that you wanna present maybe just to one supervisor, maybe to a team of people in a small conference room, maybe to the board of directors, maybe to a bigger audience even than that. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to stand there and present your ideas in a clear, confident manner in order for people who write the checks to pay for that stuff mm -hmm. to sign on and say, that's a great idea, we're gonna get behind that get R&D on it, let's get you know some budgets worked up on that, That we're gonna go with that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're gonna be a frustrated genius in your cubicle because no one will take your idea because you're not able to articulate it well. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing about these skills are once you have them, they're as natural to you as breathing. 
and I don't know that that I am really capable of going well let me see I use this here and this here it just kind of happens um, you you see a situation and you're able to connect the dots and answer a question or answer an objection in a way that maybe they didn't even think fully through the whole equation of what you're offering or what you have to to offer as a solution to a problem so I don't know that I really have a, a, a you'll probably be able to identify them more than I will because I've actually never taken the time to dissect it what I would tell you that's true too though like in, in the retail forum when a customer walks out the door, and we have done these surveys, we've actually used one of the colleges and their students and their marketing students to do exit interviews mm -hmm. as part of a mutual, I got information and they got you know the experience of doing some of these things. And we would ask people, you know, uh, did the salesperson sell you? Oh, no, 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 they didn't sell me any. Every salesperson in that store was selling you, whether you knew it or not. I actually did it a peculiar way in that I used something I learned in theater, which was creating a character and becoming a character. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I actually think it's it perhaps useful to people who are truly stunted by, by their own fears and insecurities. When you do any kind of theater and you're given a character, the character is usually very, very different from yourself, and, and, and they you study how would somebody like that behave? How would that person enter the room? How would that person sit? How would that person talk? How would that person dress? How would that person interact with others? And all of those things are what make a character, I mean, we all watch, well, you don't, but most of us watch television shows, and you start to know someone as their character. You don't even really know the actor or actress's name, chances are. Mm -hmm. And when you see them on the street, you are more likely to talk to them as their character as their character than you are as their real person. And a lot of times it's quite disappointing when you meet the real person because you're like, gee, I really like your character. You know, I mean, everybody wants Kiefer Sutherland to be Jack Bauer, you know, and, and, and when he's Kiefer Sutherland, we're kind of like, you know, Jack Bauer really wouldn't do that, but he's not Jack Bauer. So, so that was the tool that I, I created a character. I didn't like being this quiet, shy person. A, mm -hmm. So the, the summer between one school year and the next, I said, who is this person, Sunny, going to be? What is she going to be like? What is she going to do? Where is she going to live? What's her world going to look like? And gee whiz, my world looks an awful lot like that character's world because you can create anything you can envision. It was very intentional. It was very intentional. I changed everything, including my handwriting. I sat there, pages of oh, people, people watching this are going, Handwriting, handwriting, what's handwriting? Okay, <laughs> pages and pages and pages to change my handwriting. I didn't like anything about it, so I just changed it. And you know, after, I won't tell you how many decades, but quite a few, mm -hmm. this is really me now. Mm -hmm. But that's true of everybody. Whatever it is you, whatever new skill you develop, whatever new talent you develop, whatever you find in yourself and cultivate, it, it, you know, it may have been kind of forced in the very beginning, mm -hmm. but it really is who I am now. Mm -hmm. Just as just with practice of anything else, mm -hmm. you get better at it. Mm -hmm. I'm really good at being sunny now. There's a fabulous public speaker by the name of Patricia Fripp, F-R-I-P-P. -P. She is hands down the best public speaker I have ever seen and she can tell you what she's doing and why she's doing it, which most of us who are good public speakers mm -hmm. are not necessarily able to do. Mm -hmm. And she's able to, to dissect it and say, you stand this way because of this, you gesture this way because of this. Mm -hmm. And I went to see her one time. I flew down to Portland to see her. Of course, I had stores in Oregon. It was easy to do. But, but I went because somebody said, oh, you should hear this woman. She's going to be at this event mm -hmm. speaking. And she talked about how to do this, and she never stood at the podium, and she mm -hmm. did as I do. She moves throughout the, and all this, and I was like, that's why that works, because she explained mm -hmm. it, and it was such an aha moment to me. More than teaching me something, it validated what I was already mm -hmm. doing, mm -hmm. and it helped me to understand why it worked mm -hmm. so that I could do it more intentionally in other, in other scenarios. Mm -hmm. 
So literally, instead of just doing what I did naturally, I kind of went, oh, that's why that works. That's why I always get that reaction. If I did that here then, so I could then use it as a tool. She was imparting information on how to be a better public speaker. And, and she was demonstrating it by doing her speech. And then she would stop periodically and go, do you see that? Do you understand this? And I was like, oh. Specifically, she did a lot in your posture and uh, to make sure you stand and stop when you're going to deliver your point. Mm -hmm. To actually plant your feet and make eye contact, mm -hmm. sometimes several times in the room as you deliver a specific point. Mm -hmm. Because as you're moving, it's distracting from your message. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing to do during transition. It will slow down the too fast speaker mm -hmm. because if you move from point A to point B, that time period gives you a nanosecond to, yeah. to you know, refresh and regroup. She used no notes, which I don't either. She, uh, for that particular presentation, I don't believe she used any sort of overheads or power. I don't use anything. Mm -hmm. I, I will use a microphone if the room needs it, but I am 100%, this is it, this is the mm -hmm. speech. I don't do this. I don't have crutches and props. I just know my material and I talk to the audience. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be doing speeches on material you're not that familiar with, at least not as a professional mm -hmm. speaker. Mm -hmm. In a classroom environment where every week you're a different topic, etc. but by the time you actually say, oh, this is something I want to do for a career, mm -hmm. you should have an, a body of work you know well enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, stories that you can use to illustrate those points that mm -hmm. you don't need. That doesn't mean I never outline in my mind or mm -hmm. even sometimes on paper before, you know, I'll sit down and go, okay, I'm speaking to this group tomorrow. Um, okay, the group is this kind of group and their overall message that they want is this and here's kind of the three points I'd like to make while I'm there. I think I'll start with that ca this kind of story and then I want to be sure I tell them about this and then I think I'll close kind of here. I do it a lot, so and I'm not talking about things I don't know. Um, but I will also, having that flexibility allows me to improvise. I don't mean I'm making things up, but when I get down there and, and there's the mingle period before and I'm talking to you and I'm talking to some of your other coworkers and I'm getting kind of, I'll hear something and go, oh, I should talk about that mm -hmm. and I can plug it in then whereas mm -hmm. if I've got slides and a PowerPoint and a scripted mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. so I can customize up to the second I take that podium and trust mm -hmm. me I have customized as I was walking up there from something the person right before me said mm -hmm. you know and I will I will make a call back to something they just mm -hmm. heard from the previous speaker part of that is what gets me the kudos that I get as a speaker, but that is not possible if you are a scripted, mm -hmm. nailed down, if it's not on that PowerPoint, I'm not gonna know what to do, mm -hmm. speaker. Mm -hmm. Some people don't take that minutes. though. I would tell you that 90% of the speakers out there have never forced themselves to work without a net. Mm -hmm. I worked with a net one time. Mm -hmm. It was a disaster. And I literally said, never again. Mm. And I have never used notes for any speech since. Mm. I didn't use notes for my high school valedictorian speech, mm. and I used it only once under protest. I dropped my note cards. They were not numbered. Mm. I'm on my hands and knees in a suit, in a skirt, crawling around picking these up. Talk about being mortified beyond belief. And then I had to sit there and put them back in order because they weren't, I had never used notes. I didn't know you should number the pages or the note cards if you're going to use cards. Oh my God. I went back, the person who insisted I use them, I tore them up, I checked them and said, <laughs> when somebody asks you to give a speech, you can use all the note cards you want, but I've never done it before and I'm never doing it again. Are we clear? <laughs> so I don't speak on any topics I'm not knowledgeable on mm -hmm. and frankly 
if you do, you're asking for trouble. I would tell you that as a, as a performer, which is essentially what a really good speaker is, you know when you're connecting with your audience or not. You'll see heads nodding, you'll see people going, yeah, that's right. You'll hear little verbal feedbacks. Um, I can tell you if I've had an 80% day, a 90% day, or a 100% day, or a 150% day, my audience cannot. And that's something important for speakers to remember. We all want to have those 150% days where the, the moon is aligned just right and everything just flows together perfectly. I've left plenty of audiences saying, oh my God, I just really wasn't on my game today. And feeling like, you know, I, I don't know why I wasn't, I didn't feel like I connected like, because I'm familiar with me at 150%, they're not. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the speakers out there are average at best. Mm -hmm. And so me on a bad day, I don't mean to be arrogant, but me on a bad day is better than 90% of the speakers they're ever going to hear. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, where I leave going, oh gosh, you know, I don't know what was, what was with me today, but I just couldn't seem to find my stride. Um, I get the same amount of gushing feedback via emails and thank you cards and letters people write and all that as I do when I had a 150% day. Mm -hmm. So maybe the difference is not how much my audience enjoys it, but how much I enjoy it. If I get an audience where the people in the room do not already know each other, you will get a cooler response than if it's a room full of people who meet regularly and they kind of know each other. Mm -hmm. Because when you're sitting there, maybe among coworkers even, but now you know your boss is on this side of you and you don't know this person on this side of you and so you're in a, in a, in a less familiar, comfortable setting for yourself, you're less likely to laugh. You're less likely to applaud something in the middle of a sentence. You're less likely to go, uh-huh, that's right, or yeah, mm -hmm. you know, or any of those kind of positive things that people will say if they're in a group that they're comfortable in. Mm -hmm. So I think that's maybe it more than anything else. It isn't that I, I get the same amount of feedback and mail regardless of what I think mm -hmm. my speech went like. Mm -hmm. I still the same amount of books at the back, I, everything. Hmm. But at the end of the day, I would tell you that there are some that I, maybe I just enjoyed them more. Maybe, I like, maybe my audience was more on their game than, the, than other days. What made them more effective? Okay, so the first thing is if you start your speech saying, thank you for having me. Okay, you have, and I learned this in advertising, you have this much time and it's a speck of time to catch people's attention. Do not waste it. Mm -hmm. Your performance starts the second you are in the same arena. That could be the airplane. That could be the airport. That could be the hotel lobby. That could be the breakfast at the front of the event. It, your performance starts the second you're in the, in the vicinity of, of your audience. Mm -hmm. And people, people miss that. They don't know when the speech starts. They think it starts when somebody hands them the microphone. No, your speech started when you showed up. But that's true of everything in life. Interviews start the second you pull into the parking lot. They really do. Um, so it's not really any different from real life. It's just people don't think about that. And when you hit that stage, everybody is going, oh God, how long is this gonna go? You know, maybe I should have gone to the bathroom before this started. Oh, maybe I got time to go get another cup of coffee. Honestly, you can see them. They're in their seats and that's what they're doing and that's what they're squirming. You have to hit them hard right off the bat with something that makes them go, okay, maybe this is worth listening to. In my case, I, I make jokes about, you know, being the mattress queen. I always open that way. I give people the introduction. It has the line. I say, here, here's my introduction. Please use it. They read it. They get a chuckle. I get a chuckle. Everybody's like, okay, this, this will be okay. You know, mm -hmm. and particularly if you're somebody like me, and I, according to the National Speakers Association, I fall under the celebrity speaker category, <laughs> which I find quite amusing, but meaning people already know who you are before you get there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, people have preconceived notions. Oh, that's that obnoxious lady from the television. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? Or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to make sure that you don't reinforce any of those stereotypes mm -hmm. right off the bat. Because if you do, they go, oh, we already know what this is all about. Mm -hmm. So if you can do something that kind of catches them off balance a little. So the, the worst speeches always start with, thank you for having me. That was me. Sometimes I kind of will say, you know, gee, I really appreciate, you know, the chance to be here and I hope you'll take some of these lessons. So there's a way to close and say thank you at the same time. You have to let people know it's finished. You have to let people know it's done besides just walking off the, otherwise they won't know when to stand and clap. And of course they're going to stand and clap if you did a good job. Um, Okay, so first of all, until you really know your stuff and are comfortable thinking on your feet, don't take questions, okay? It's a bad idea, because that's the last thing they're gonna remember. Um, I have questions that come up regularly. Some speakers would say, oh, well, then I need to incorporate that into my material, because that's stuff people wanna know. Yes and no. Sometimes I will do that. I'll say, you know, one of the questions I get asked all the time is this, so I'll talk about it. But a lot of times, I'll actually leave it for the Q&A because there are some things that people want to know, and maybe there's a story that you like to tell that relates to that or whatever that doesn't really fit with all the rest of your material. So it's okay to leave something for the Q&A that you know they're going to ask, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be prepared to answer it. You know, I, I've gotten the same question enough times that I pretty much know the answers to all of them, and I've figured out a way to, much as you whittle down your little stories and examples into bullet point, or, you know, concise enough chunks that you can deliver them quickly. You know, sometimes I'll say, you know, the best way to answer that is to tell you a little quick story. And then I'll get to tell the story mm -hmm. that doesn't fit with any of the other message I was delivering, but mm -hmm. is a valuable nugget anyway. Mm -hmm. So I use Q&A that way. Uh, if you're easily flustered, don't because it's a bad idea. Um, you know, what do they say? Lawyers say never ask a question you're not absolutely sure you want the answer to or that you don't already know the answer to. Um, I, I speak to high school kids and I take questions, which is really bold. Yeah. First two questions are always the same. Sometimes they're in opposite order sometimes, but they're always the same. How much money do you make and what do you drive? It's the scope of their world. You know, and I say, and I tell the administrators, I said, I'm happy. And they said, oh, you might want to be. I said, listen, the first two questions are going to be one of these two, and the second one's going to be the other one. Mm -hmm. And they go, really? And then when it happens, I kind of <laughs> look over at them, and they go, okay, you do. Because it is true. Mm -hmm. But but everybody's going to, you know, people are more willing to ask questions in a room full of people where they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. People are less likely to ask the question they really want to ask if they're in a room full of strangers or people they perceive to be their superiors, mm -hmm. bosses, uh, people from other departments, et cetera, that they may not know very well. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're very hesitant to ask those kind of que the mm -hmm. questions they really want to ask. So the last thing I always say is, you know what, I'm going to be over there in the back. If you had some questions that I didn't have a chance mm -hmm. to get to mm -hmm. or that you really didn't want to ask publicly, mm -hmm. feel free to come. Boom, there's a line every time. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of people who want permission to come ask you something mm -hmm. they didn't want to ask at the podium. Mm -hmm. Preparation, but not rehearsal. Mm -hmm. I think there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, preparation is just simply knowing your stuff mm -hmm. and, and having thought of a story and, and fine-tuned a story. And, and I do a lot of this work in my car. Mm -hmm. So if you see me driving down the road, people think I'm singing to the radio or they think I'm talking on my cell phone, you know, over some Bluetooth. I'm not. I'm, I'm telling one of my stories. And, and I want to know how long it takes, you know, to, to tell. And is that the best word to use in that scenario? Or, or is there another way to do that? The other thing that I use to fine tune my stories is my weekly blog. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is because, you know, you've got to encapsulize a point in a few hundred words. Mm -hmm. And I find that that helps me mm -hmm. to whittle down a point or to get, to come up with even ongoing current examples because I mean if you're somebody like me and you really haven't run a business for more years than I'd like to admit now mm -hmm. um, you know 12 13 years mm -hmm. you don't want to be 
well, what's that got to do with me today? You know, you're not running a business today. So by continuing to do my business blog every week, I'm relating to current things and current examples mm -hmm. and examples in other businesses that I see that illustrate what I think are good business practices or good customer experiences or whatever, and I'm able to weave those into my ongoing material so that frequently something I just blogged about in the last 30 days will end up on, somebody will ask a question and I'll use it as an answer mm -hmm. or I'll use it as one of the examples to a mm -hmm. point I'm trying to make in a speech I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. So it keeps my material fresh, which I think is a big deal too. Mm -hmm. And that it would be a very good example, yes, because I do tell stories. And sometimes I tell a story I've never told in front of an audience before, and I'll say, oh my God, I don't think I've ever told this to an audience before. Mm -hmm. And that makes people feel special. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that sort of candor with your audience. Mm -hmm. And if anything, it endears you to the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tad of vulnerability, if you will. Oh my gosh, you're out here on the cliff, you know, without a, you know, but I work without a net all the time. So probably, I, I, I probably almost do it. A, almost regularly. I mean, I did it. I did a speech for a group and I was, what in the world? Oh, I just did it actually not two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It's like, what am I going to say to this group? So I literally was talking to some of my friends a couple of days mm -hmm. before. And I said, what in the world? You know, this is not my normal audience. Mm -hmm. I think collectively there's more wisdom in this room than I'll ever possess. So what am I going to say to these people that isn't condescending mm -hmm. or, or, I mean, it's actually going to have some value to them. And, and I literally said things like that to several of my friends who said, oh, you should tell them this. You know, my parents always like this story. I was like, really? I've never told that to an audience before. And I did that then. Mm. And I did several. I've done several of those recently where completely new material just for them, you know, something that made the point that I just never have pulled out before. And, Oh, yeah, I do have an example like that. You have to get good at connecting the dots in your life, though. And, and I would tell you that the skill that I don't know how to teach, and if you can do it, you'll, you'll be the best professor in the world, is the ability to connect the dots from A to B to get you to C. People will see A, and they'll see B. They do not see that that connects to C. You know, they really don't. You have to figure out generally what the overall one message you want people to leave with is. That's it. And everything you do needs to relate to that in some way, shape, or form. Try to make too many points, you're going to lose people. Uh, if you say, here's seven tips for doing whatever, trust me, by the time you get through five, you're going to be out of time. Um, I, I never give a number to it. I, I never say, here's the three tips to do whatever. I just say, here's some things you might want to try. And then I can do as many as I can come up with or as many as it takes for me to, if I realize I'm running long, I can chop out the last two. I say, you know what, there's a whole lot more, so you'll just have to have me come back. Yeah. And sure enough, within the next year, I'll get an invitation to come back. They said, you said you had more. We want the rest of them. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Now i got to remember which ones I said to you because I don't write this stuff down. My organization is really more in my calendar and in making sure I have directions and I've map quested where I'm going and I know how long it's going to take to get there and my clothes are laid out the night before so I've tried everything on. I know that the zipper zips and that nothing gapes and that I'm not going to be fighting something the whole time, uh, that that doesn't itch. or I mean, I know that seems really silly, but those are the things that when you're up there in front of the audience, allows you to focus on your message and not on any of these little distractions. Mm -hmm. So my organization really isn't as much in my material because I would tell you I do that literally mm -hmm. most of the time in the car on the way to the mm -hmm. event. Um, but it is in all the other things that allow me to be able to do what I do and be fully present when I'm there and not be stressed and not be fidgeting and not be distracted. Mm -hmm. So for me, my organization comes from them maintaining my calendar and, and having done that prep work to make sure I'm where I'm supposed to be, when I'm supposed to be, dressed the way I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Well, it does, yeah, because the blog, keep, having that weekly commitment 
forces me to continually develop new material and to kind of have my eye open to examples of things good and bad that I can use to make a broader point. Whenever I blog on anything, it's not to bash a particular business for its failings. It's to illustrate to a bigger audience how we can all learn from that and, and how we can do things better and differently. I don't think there's a market for a negative speaker. If there, if there is, it's, it's in the comedy clubs and your name is Lewis Black, uh, you know what I mean? And, 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 and you're, you're somebody who has that kind of a persona and, and it usually only works in you know, that kind of television or, or comedic kind of venue. I do not know of a business or, or association or trade group that would routinely hire a negative speaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's plenty of negative. They really always are inviting you in because they want people to, to be excited and pumped up and energized mm -hmm. and, and you know, new tools that they can take back and immediately implement, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. That's what people are paying big bucks for. Mm -hmm. They're not paying big bucks for what they already have, which is a bunch of people whining and moaning. I didn't intend to be a public speaker either. And you may never become a public speaker, but the ability to express yourself comfortably and confidently will serve your career regardless of what your career is. Whenever you are more comfortable making eye contact, making conversation, you're just going to be thrilled with the enhancements that brings to your life. You know, there are there are three things that I have done consistently throughout my life that I believe altered the course of my life. Mm -hmm. One of which is I try something new every day. And I think we all get in a rut and we all get into the groove of doing exactly the same thing the same way, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you continually force yourself outside your comfort zone, which mm -hmm. maybe taking this class is mm -hmm. an example of that mm -hmm. for them, mm -hmm. I believe what happens is you get comfortable with change. And whether you like it or not, change is a part of life. And change is going to be thrust upon you, usually when you least expect it. And so your ability to become more resilient and more adaptable is a very, very valuable life skill. So taking a class outside your comfort zone disqualifies as something new to do today. Every time you get up and make a speech on a topic you've never spoken on, you can check off, okay, under Sunny's list of things I have to do every day, this counts as my something new. The other thing I do is I talk to absolutely everyone. Mm -hmm. I chat with people in line at the grocery store. I'm not, ha I'm not having big conversations with people. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, oh, have you tried that cereal? You know, I saw an ad for that, but I didn't. Have you tasted it yet? Is it good? Oh, I might have to try that next time. I'm making those sort of meaningless, mundane chit chat mm -hmm. because being social is a muscle. And if you don't exercise it, then suddenly you're in a room full of people you need to network with for your career, for your spouse's career, whatever. And you're like, uh, I, don't, I don't know anybody here. I can't talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. So I believe if you routinely talk to everybody, just make mm -hmm. eye contact and say hello, mm -hmm. that you're going to be surprised at what doors get open for you. And then the last thing I am is I'm eternally grateful. You know, I am the poster child for the American dream. I'm a, a poor girl from Kansas City. My immigrant grandparents never spoke English. I'm second generation U.S., raised in a working class family. I have a high school diploma. I teach at Harvard Business School, for goodness sakes. How does that happen, you know? And it's because I did all of those things. I tried new things. I got outside my comfort zone. I wasn't afraid of change. I embraced change. You know, I met a lot of people. You know, every door that was ever held open for me anywhere in the world was held open by another person. Whether it was a physical door or a metaphorical door, it doesn't matter. And to be grateful to live where you live and to have the opportunity to get up and stand and speak. There are countries where that's not even allowed, regardless of the content of what you have to say. I'm not saying controversial things. I'm saying there are places where a woman would not be allowed to get up and speak. Mm -hmm. And so to be grateful every single day mm -hmm. for the challenges that are presented to you and the opportunity to, to get through them, I, I just believe is a very, really important thing. And those are the sunny lessons of life is to try something new, talk to everybody, 
and, and be grateful because there's a lot to be grateful for.